Hi, Tom. This is Paul Revere. The station commander took a deep breath to make sure his voice was steady. If anything remained intact on Earth, the recording of what he said next would likely be a part of it. Subspace sensor platforms confirm 800 and counting capital grade transition distortions, and 1500 and counting escort grade. I am launching scouting drones and activating the Shattered Heaven protocol. He paused again, and then, the voice hoarse, said, They're here. My god, they're here. Humanity had been at war with the Enduring Empire of the Second Star for twenty-seven Terran years. Instead of a swift, decisive victory like the Empire had usually enjoyed since expanding into this arm of the galaxy, the war had dragged on for cycle after cycle. This was an annoyance to the Empire, but ultimately it was only that. Despite that fact, the Emperor was getting impatient. After ascending to the throne and realizing how valuable human technological, tactical, and strategic input might be, Emperor T. Sunajai had pushed for a sooner end to the conflict. Besides, they had reasoned with their war council, they didn't need other technic species in this harm getting the idea that all wars with the Empire could be drawn out to such an extent. To this end, the Empire had, separately from its already deployed fleets in the Orion Arm, assembled a grand strike force that alone might have defeated the human navy. Or perhaps multiple navies. The Imperials could never be bothered to remember every barbarian nation of every fractured species. By the time the strike force, a fleet really, or even two, had fully assembled, about 30 million kilometers outside the orbit of Pluto, it was composed of 877 capital ships and 1,743 escorts, not including logistical assets. In comparison, the Unified Nations of Humanity had been able to assemble 106 capital ships, if one was generous to some of the cruisers, and 308 escorts. Hancock Station, Last Year Station, and the Greater Star Federation supercarriers would be able to put about 1,300 fighters in space total, but realistically, they would be cycling fighters in and out. The Shattered Heaven Protocol would awaken dormant system defense-sized interplanetary strategic munitions scattered throughout the system, and use every military and government satellite secret routines to guide themselves to their targets. The huge heavy missiles could each carry a couple dozen submunitions, but if they were intercepted before their terminal phase, all of those would go down with them. The fact of the matter was that despite the humans' knowledge that they had been steadily losing for 27 years, they hadn't expected the enemy to be in Seoul until about five weeks before. That was very little time to prepare. And even with the wormhole gates, reinforcements had been slow to return, especially since the Empire had not weakened any of its other fleets to assemble this strike force. Indeed, that was the reason why many human governments had decided that the Empire could not possibly be gearing up for a deep strike. And so, humanity's last line of defense assembled to lose their final battle. Three weeks before. I must implore the Council to reconsider. The Sylve, appearing much like a strange wolf standing on its hind legs, sank into a distinctly defensive posture as he addressed the leaders sitting about the low table before him. One of them replied to him in a dismissive tone. Grand Defender of the Realm, there is simply no reason for us to come to the aid of the humans. A debt of honor is, at best, an outdated nicety we assign to a species we've gone to war with before. Something snapped in Grand Defender of the Realm, sings with fire's eyes. Something kindled. His body rose up to its full, intimidating height, his sash and colored mark tied to his right arm flashing. An outdated nicety? Why even offer them that, when we have no honor of our own with which to judge others worthy of it? You in particular have no honor, Counselor, and I dare you to challenge me on that. A hushed whisper of shock swept through the chamber, but before the accused Counselor could reply, Sings with Fire continued. A dare you will not answer, but that does not matter, as no one was ever truly convinced of your honor. In fact, I would go so far as to say the only thing that might redeem any appreciable measure of that elusive modicum of honor you must have once possessed is to for once in your career fulfill your duty to the people. The chamber was silent now. Stings with fire sent a mental command through his neural implant, activating a political star map. The nations of other species glowed in different colors, but one stood out more than the others. A harsh scarlet region. Do you see it, Counselor? Growled Sings with fire in a measured rumbling tone. The enduring empire? Do you think they will stop with the humans? Do you think they will stop the Onsinid? Perhaps their expansion will halt after conquering the Rasok, right on our border? I'm going to assume your negligence in enforcing the security of our species is born of an utter lack of cognitive function rather than a treasonous, dishonorable, or otherwise malicious dereliction of your own duties. Before most of the sylve in the chamber could even fully process the rebuke, another counselor spoke up. What if coming to the human's aid merely makes us a target? 
Sings with Fire made a harsh sound in his throat that was somewhere between an expression of humor and one of anger. You still do not realize. He sent another command, and the Scarlet Region drew back dramatically. Then again. Then it disappeared. With sudden brutality, the Scarlet Region began growing back to its former size in huge bursts. Two standard years. Sings with Fire announced with great precision. Their first incursion was two standard years ago. Again, silence reigned. My argument is made, the Grand Defender of the Realm said quietly. The Counselor Primarch may have the floor. Admiral Thessalius, I appreciate our strategic situation, but I don't think it's feasible for us, politically or militarily, to come to the rescue of the humans. We were at war with them not ten cycles ago, and they were occupying our world until the end of last cycle. Admiral Thessalius, the Greater Sanson Union's Director of Military Intelligence, sighed inwardly. He knew the Senator was probably right, but he also might have been fatally short-sighted. Thessalius wasn't about to allow himself to lose focus on the big picture, not when everything he'd worked so hard to build was at stake, not when his family might ultimately suffer at the hands of tyrants again. A note of desperation rang in his voice. I know we're crippled compared to our pre-war condition, Senator, and I know helping our former enemies might be unpopular, but you must think about the future. Despite their conflict with the Enduring Empire, the humans were able to rally all of their militaries to fight both that war and the one against us, as well as engage in all of their other galactic affairs. And before both of those wars, they defeated the Sylv. Not only that, but they were the ones who oversaw the installation of our new government. Of you and me in our current positions. Not to mention those who will come after us to govern our children. Hells, maybe those governors will be our children. They can do that now, regardless of what their caste may have been. My son, my daughter, they don't have to be warriors like me now. They need not lay down their lives for a better world because we've built that world for them. As he spoke, he saw some senators narrow their eyes in concentration. Some leaned forward ever so slightly. Some of them even looked like they agreed with him. The desperation left his voice, and it became hard and unflinching like the armored hull of a battleship. I will not give up that world. I will not stand idly by as those who adhere to the laws of war, even while we did not are swept away. I will not watch as all we have worked for comes under threat from the Enduring Empire. He locked eyes with the senators directly opposite him. And I will not allow someone else's sons and daughters to live in the kind of world their fathers and mothers laid down their lives to prevent. He tapped a button on his cuff computer, and the smart walls surrounding them came to life as the lights dimmed. And senators, I don't think aiding the humans will be nearly as unpopular as you might believe. I've mentioned their role in helping to create our new government, but what the people here on the capital will remember even more viscerally is the Stakachi attacks. Stakachi was a relatively small city on the other main continent from the capital city that had seen a series of terrorist attacks from a bitter group of former freedom fighters who believed that their recent revolution hadn't gone far enough. They'd bombed several areas in the city with binary explosives they'd fabricated themselves, unable to get their hands on a tactical nuke or something worse. The Celia switched to the first image. Do you know why the people remember the attack, Senators? Do you know why the humans weren't seen as oppressors in the end? Do you know why some of the people might not just be willing, but eager to help the humans? This. This is why. He lifted one of his hands to gesture meaningfully at one of the smart wall screens. They saved us from ourselves. Again. The image was perhaps one of the most well-known images in recent history. A human stood in the center in power armor. A war goddess wrapped in powerful artificial muscles and alloy weave. Yet she had no weapon in hand. Instead, her exposed face showed her teeth clenched and her eyes filled with determination and pain. She fought not to kill, but to save those around her. And none of them were human. She held above her in her arms part of a collapsing building, giving time to those trapped inside to flee to safety. Even to the senators, not human themselves, she looked as though she didn't care for her own well-being as long as the people were able to make it out. And they had. Every single person not killed in the initial blast had made it out alive. The Celius's grim voice rang quietly. This human soldier served in the army of their nation of Canada. She had been on world for two days before she gave her life for aliens she did not know and never would. Two days, Senators. The next image phased into view. Three humans all wearing different models of power armor stood in the middle of a debris-strewn street. The camera that had captured the image had a view well above and behind the action, so the senators could see a huddled mass of schoolchildren in the open just a few meters behind the humans. On the other end of the street, a hovering truck bore nine terrorists carrying large weapons. Despite that, the humans had their weapons raised in brave defiance. My gods, 
one of the senators exclaimed. That's my daughter. That's when they saved my daughter. The Salius nodded. Yes, it is. A soldier from the new Terran hegemony. A marine from the United States. And a soldier from the United Kingdom. All of them survived, yet they clearly did not know at the time that this would be the case. Yet there they stood, Senator, between your daughter and a hail of steel. He allowed the hushed room to gaze upon the scene for a little longer, and then he switched to the next. This human too was in power armor, but like the first, they weren't attempting to kill anything. This image, also like the first, was well known to the people. The human was bent over a bloodied female, a bright hologram showing the inside of her abdomen floating over her, as the human worked frantically to stabilize the dying person. The red crescent emblazoned on her armored bicep identified her as a medic, specifically of the New Mecca Republic. That woman she was working so hard to save bled out, despite her best efforts, Thessalius said. And do you know what she did? She did not stop. She got up, sanitized her gauntlets, and moved on to the next wounded person, whose life she did save. And she saved the one after that, and the next three, she single-handedly saved 18 gravely wounded people, and was awarded the Alliance's Silver Nova for outstanding medical aid rendered during a disaster. And the people know about that award, Senators. The humans made sure our news services were informed of it. Don't you see? They were telling us something with that award. They were sending us a message that told us how they saw us. She worked only on patients whose species was alien to her that day, yet she was awarded that Silver Nova. She was awarded a human medal for saving our people. They saw the saving of those lives the same way they see the saving of human lives. There was no distinction made between our people and humans in the text that accompanied the award. The screens returned to their idle background, and the lights brightened. The Celius continued. We may not have much of the military left compared to what we had once, but I am prepared to lead every marine, ship, and soldier we have to Seoul in defense of the humans and of our own children. The first senator who stood was one whose daughter had been saved by those three courageous humans. The children of the stars were a race, if they could even be classified as such, of what had once been protostellar matter, though they may have been something else even before that. Vast electrical storms and chemical interactions formed their thoughts, and usually these thoughts were slow, deliberate. They were not slow now, though they were still quite deliberate. The humans are in danger, the first put forth. Memories of how the children perceived the humans flickered between vaguely defined clouds of plasma and gas and wildly twisted matter. They are good to us, the second sent back. We spoke with them. They listened. They knew their ships could hurt us with their star jumping. They knew we could not fight them, and they knew they could gain more valuable things for themselves if they did not heed us. Yet they did. The third had the strongest signal of all. They defended us. They sent their vessels of war and defended us. More, they sent their vessels of those who would seek knowledge. They spoke to us more. They helped us to explore our own past and vastly expanded our, and vastly expanded our capability to understand the universe around us. The first replied, a flash of energy stretching out across the heavens for over a light week. We must defend them. We must defend the humans. The second cried out as well. The second cried out as well. Gather the ships, ready the shells. This shall be our gift to them, our evolution into beings of action, into beings who can defend those who would defend them. Elsewhere, a Ruari scientist stood before his king, showing him just how much effort and resources it took for human scientists to cure the reaping plague. He pointed to charts, showed diagrams, held up a container of dead crop samples to show just how deadly the plague had been to their crops. Even when the plague had jumped from crops to Rawari, and then from Rawari to humans. Even when the human scientists had been utterly horrified to learn that it was an ancient nanoweapon, they hadn't stopped in their quest for a cure. In the end, they succeeded, and then they had left. But the Rawari had learned from them. Their medical and agricultural technology leapfrogged decades or even centuries of development. The Rawari had battered, stolen, and reverse engineered technology from interstellar civilizations that had passed through their local wormhole. They'd used starships adapted from human technology to win sovereignty over that wormhole. The transit fees had made them very wealthy after that. In fact, they'd recently constructed several new battleships, and the Navy wished to test them in combat. The king stood, his face thoughtful. And then he looked down at the scientist. He bade him to rise, placing a hand on his shoulder. As they saved us cycles ago, so shall we save them. 
On yet another world, a counselor argued bitterly with a rival pacifist about the definition of a just war. It was the humans who taught us of just war, he roared. They made contact with us during a planet-wide civil war between six different factions. We were slaughtering each other with reckless genocidal abandon. We were detonating tactical warheads in rural villages, gods be damned. Yet the humans saw us not as the monsters we were, but as a civilization, the nation we could be. Before they came, our languages had no words for any sort of justice or morality in war, because we had deliberately disposed of the concepts long ago. Do you not comprehend what the gods are calling us to do? What we are destined to do in order to redeem ourselves? Two of his six fists slammed down on the table in front of him. This is not even a choice. We come to the aid of the humans or we betray what we have become. A Chixikut raised a ceremonial sword against the Enduring Empire, using its own eye core to paint the symbol denoting soul on its abdomen. A race of machines integrated with each other's minds to remind themselves that humans had taught them of independence and individuality. The Silger took, who had only recently accepted a permanent human ambassador in their space, gathered the greatest fleet they'd ever amassed simply because the ambassador had been kind to one of them. First impressions were quite important in their primary culture. The Kisudaraki Collective called a ceasefire with their cousin species of the Heleruk Confederacy so that their emissaries might speak of a greater threat to themselves than each other's territorial disputes. The emissaries had quickly become great friends and decided that the first thing their nation should do to cement further cooperation should be to answer the human's call. The Alliance, after all, had given them better warp drives. Their disputes no longer meant anything. A hive mind on a small moon in a remote system absorbed a scout polyp and its knowledge. The humans were in danger, the same humans who had healed it when it had encountered a great disease in the depths of its original world. In seconds, it had made its decision. The aquatic Masatomati Mencia were not a particularly technologically inclined people, and they had no concept of war. But they did have a concept of support, and they did understand danger. They could no longer use great weapons in the ancient armory at the core of their third moon, but the humans and their allies could. They passed along these weapons to the next Sylph freighter that moved through their system, with a message composed of the most beautiful melodic Masamati Mencia speech that could be conveyed in wavelengths humans could hear. They sang of hope and support. They sang of their love of human symphonies. They sang of a future for humans. Every species, every nation, every culture, and every ethnicity on every planet humans had interacted with, in some positive way, heard the humans call for help. They heard their rallying cry. They heard the response of the Sylve, the Flitchtons, of the Rowari. They saw the great dreadnoughts the Children of the Stars had fashioned from their own bodies closing in on Sol. They saw the Rowari's fleet, a small but feisty force drawn mostly from its own capital system, speed towards humanity's home system, calling all who they passed to arms, the Frontinari, the Chixicut, the Collective, and the Confederacy, destroyers, frigates, cruisers, and carriers, the great battlecruisers and battleships and dreadnoughts of all humanity's friends, allies, and defenders all filled the hyperlanes into Seoul. Hi, Com, this is Paul Revere. We have exactly 700 capital grade transitions in progress, as well as 4,032 escort grade. I don't even know if anyone down there is hearing this. Please, God, someone answer. The Empire had landed troops on the Jovian moons, the stations around Saturn, the dome cities on Mars, the floating metropolises of Venus and horrifically, Earth itself. They didn't have orbital supremacy around Earth yet, but they would in time, and several stealth drops and kinetic impactors had made it through the orbital defense grid. Chaos reigned on the surface of humanity's birth world as the sky came down, bringing with it Imperial shock troopers and metal rods. ICOM, this is Paul Revere. Update the tactical plots. The previously reported transitions are friendlies. I repeat, previously reported transitions are friendlies. Christ, there has to be thousands of them. More. A recon buoy just confirmed the destruction of part of the Imperial fleet train and a squadron of Imperial heavy cruisers. Update friendly transitions on the other side of the system. There's more of them. Ultimately, the fleet of redemption would be commanded by a team that was led by Admiral Thessalius and the son of Sings with Fire, fleet leader Teeth of Iron. The unsung heroes of the Last Battle of Seoul would be the communications officers, who strung together the human communications buoys, the translation AIs, and the communication suites of every capital ship and smaller warship they could possibly bring into the communications loop. It would be the largest single battle in anyone's recorded history, going by the number of warship hulls involved and the fact that the fighting eventually extended to the ground. The saviors of humanity landed thousands upon thousands of soldiers, marines, and commandos on the worlds and stations of Seoul. 
utterly overwhelming the embarked forces of the Enduring Empire. In space, the overall battle was punctuated by gargantuan ship-to-ship -ship engagements around key tactical points. The chaos of the battle meant that too few or too many shots and missiles were sometimes allocated to certain targets, and this would cost lives and ammunition. But the friendly fleet kept on going. There was not a single firing pass, not a single missile salvo, not a single chase where the Imperial Navy wasn't outnumbered. It was only through the brilliant tactical maneuvers of the Imperial's third in command that they were even able to fight their way to the hyperlane that was oriented vaguely back towards their own territory. Yet the battle didn't stop there. Even as the ground forces killed or captured every single Imperial trooper, detached fleets and squadrons and flotillas followed the Imperial fleet through the hyperlane and clashed with them several days later on the other side, destroying most of the remainder of their fleet train and killing the third in command, leaving the last shreds of the Imperial fleet mortally wounded. They would surrender as their supplies ran out six systems and two engagements later. Back in Seoul, the arrivals of thousands of merchant ships signaled the beginning second phase of the Defender's plans. Raw materials, starship expendables, workers and technicians, processors, refined components, and everything else needed to repair Seoul was packed into every ship the Defender governments were able to summon and supply on short notice. The supply lines established in the supply lines established in the emergency became solidified. The communications lines and relays were officially sanctioned, and most of the Defender species were tied together economically. Eventually, treaties and agreements were signed, old issues resolved, and new issues quickly put to rest. The saving of humanity would be, for at least some period of time, the saving of their entire region of the galaxy, simply because so many species had found a friend in the human race. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. Everything I used is in the description below. If there's a story you'd like to hear narrated, let me know and I'll reach out to the author and see if we can make that happen. Thanks again. It's a scary world out there, but remember to be brave and look up to seek the stars.